Good morning, Faith Covenant family. He is risen. Ah, I wish I could be there in person right now to hear your joyful response. That is one of my favorite parts of Easter morning is proclaiming that to each other back and forth. And I cannot even begin to describe to you how deeply disappointed I am to miss out on Holy Week this year. This this is my favorite week of the church year. This is my favorite Sunday out of all 52 Sundays. So I am so disappointed. Um, but the whole family, we're recovering from COVID. We're, we're starting to feel better and be on the mend. Um, so thank you for the ways that you've reached out and cared for us. Um, we do appreciate that. Um, but uh, being disappointed this week, um, even though it's been a super big bummer, um, it's actually prepared me to preach to you this morning. Uh, because the hope of the resurrection comes to us in the midst of disappointment. Let me guess, you're probably disappointed about something even right now. It could be with your job, it could be with yourself, it could be with somebody else. Uh, it could be with a relationship, with the church, with the state of the world. Uh, it could be a number of things. It could be simply the fact that uh, you're watching this sermon on a screen and not in person. Okay, uh, But the hope of the resurrection comes to us in the midst of disappointment. It's hard to fathom how disappointed Jesus' disciples would have been when he died. They expected him to be their king, to be their leader, to be the hope of, of the nation. So in Mark 16, when a few women go to anoint Jesus' body, we know that they are walking there deeply disappointed, dismayed, discouraged, despondent. And before we jump into that story, would you please join me in a word of prayer? O living God, we pray that as we open up your word this morning, that you would speak to us in our place of greatest need. In the midst of our deepest disappointments, come bring your resurrection hope into our lives, into our hearts. Enable me to be your servant now as I proclaim your word. Speak, O Lord, your servants are listening. Amen. Now, when these three women uh, hear the most wonderful news, that Jesus is alive but not dead, wouldn't you expect them to be immediately joyful? Their deepest disappointment is solved. Let's throw the big Easter celebration. Let's respond with joyful news. I mean, wouldn't you expect... This, this to be a happy ever after ending. But that's not how the story goes in the Gospel of Mark, one of the four books that was written to tell the life story of Jesus. The women who are witnesses of the resurrection, they leave the tomb afraid. Now, if you were trying to make up a religion, you would not write the story like this, that there's just a few women who leave the tomb afraid. I mean, people in that society, we know, did not trust the testimony of women. And so you would not write a story like this in this way unless this is how it actually happened. The Gospel of Mark, it ends very mysteriously. Three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Salome, they head to the tomb where Jesus has been laid. And they find the stone that was in front of the tomb, rolled away, they encounter an angelic figure who tells them that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the very last verse of the gospel says, Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus, this is the best news ever, but upon hearing it and believing it, these women have mixed emotions. And so do we sometimes. Like the women who received this news, sometimes we feel like they did, do we not? Alarmed, trembling, bewildered, and afraid. In the past two years, have you ever felt alarmed? Have you trembled at bad news? Have you felt confused as to how the resurrection might make a difference in all this? Or if you're a Christian, have you been afraid? to speak about him to anybody for any reason. 
We hear the hope of the resurrection while we carry these feelings. And hearing the news itself can be alarming or strange or confusing or perhaps convicting. And it's only upon further reflection that these women and the rest of the disciples, they realize that this actually is the best news in the world. One of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, wrote later on in life, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And friends, what I want to say to you this morning, because Jesus walked out of the tomb, we can walk in hope. Because he walked out of that tomb, we can walk in hope today. I want to give you three reasons why I believe that is true. The first is this. We have hope because what we do matters eternally. We have hope because what we do matters eternally. Now, Mary, Mary, and Salome went as soon as they could to the tomb very early on a Sunday morning. And they brought spices to anoint Jesus' body. They were not there for embalming, but they, they brought these spices uh, they would be, that would smell good and they would mix them with oil as a way to, to cover up the smell of the decaying body that was in the tomb. The women were not at all expecting the resurrection. They were in grief. They had no hope. He was dead. And there was nothing they could do about it, they thought. Now, if that was true, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then it's true, we, we don't have hope. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then this world is all there is. And all that we do in our lives, with our time, with our relationships, they will all be wiped away by time and be forgotten. Whether you're religious or not, spiritual or not, I believe every single human being has a deep need for a life of purpose, for your life to matter, for your life to mean something. And the resurrection gives us this hope. I mean, if Jesus had remained dead, the most his disciples could do would be to care for a dead body or to care for a tomb. But thanks be to God, we are not here for a memorial service. We're not here for a funeral. We're not here to anoint a dead body. We're not here to worship a memory. We have hope because Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. It's not up to us, friends, to anoint his dead body. It's not up to us to try to keep Jesus alive, to try to keep his memory going, to try to keep the machine going. No, he is truly alive by the power of God. God raised him from the dead. Now, If a pastor can get a little creative, Christianity teaches that Jesus is alive now, reigning in heaven. That's the spiritual dimension of our world. And now his his body is the church living on the earth. Now, the church, his body, can smell sometimes because it's full of sinful people like us. And like the women wanted to do at the tomb, it might seem like all that we can do is just try, to, just try to cover up the smell a little bit. Let's just bring some perfume in here. Try to make things smell just a little bit better. And sometimes this can lead us to despair. We don't find perfect community and love in the church. And yet, my friends, because Jesus' living spirit fills his body, the church. The church is not dead, but alive in Jesus Christ. We are not dead. We are alive. The church is not dead, but it's alive in Jesus. And the church does not exist by our own attempts to make it alive. The church, his body, it lives simply because he lives. I hope someone is saying amen in that sanctuary right now. He lives, and we live because he lives. And friends, that means that what you do as a member of his body will always matter eternally. How you serve the Lord in the church or at work or in your daily life, it matters. And if, if Jesus was dead, then, then, then all we could do would just be, just be anointing a dead body. But because he is alive, all we do in him will have eternal significance 
forevermore. Because Jesus is alive, your labor in Him and for Him is never, ever in vain. So give yourselves fully to it. He sees, He knows, He receives your love. So walk in hope. What you do matters eternally. The second reason we have hope is because God can do the impossible. We have hope because God can do the impossible. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, what can't he do, right? One of Jesus' most famous sayings is, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, this doesn't mean that we can treat God like a genie and just ask God for whatever we, we want. We know that. So what do we mean when we say that God can do the impossible? Well, I think scripture aims at that answer in two ways. It means that we can enter the life of the kingdom now and we can enter the kingdom after we die. That's what God can do. We can, he can help us enter the kingdom now and enter the kingdom after we die. Two things that in human strength and power would be impossible for us, but with God it is possible. The Apostle Paul, he was writing about God's power in Ephesians 3.20. He said, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Now notice this, according to his power that is at work in us. Where? This impossible power is working in here. Within us, living in his kingdom now. So let me ask you, are you struggling with some type of addiction or or maybe a sin and you just can't seem to, to break it? God can help you break it with his power. Do you feel too guilty to be forgiven of a sin, something that you've done that you regret? Good news, God can forgive. Do you feel too afraid to confront the issues you've been facing? God can give you boldness. Do you feel weary by what's going on in the world? God can give you perseverance. Do you feel confused about Jesus or what's true in life? God can open your eyes to the truth. Perhaps you feel like you can't change after all these years. God can transform you. He can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Now, when the, when the women arrived at the tomb that day, God did way more than they were thinking. They asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, Excuse me. The main problem to them was that the rock needed to be moved. The rock needed to be moved. That was the main problem to them. And God took care of that. God rolled the stone away. He did solve the obstacle they were concerned about. But let's be real. The rock was really not their biggest issue. The biggest obstacle to them was that their Savior was dead. Was that Jesus was dead. That was the true issue. And the reality is, all of us, sometimes we get so focused on the problems of this life, on our earthly problems, that we forget and we don't pay attention to the greatest problem that every single human being has. That we are all mortal. We will all die. And when you watch a body be lowered into the grave, does it not seem impossible that our loved one could come back to life it seems so final certainly there's not there's nothing we can do about it all that we can do is kind of do what these women did we can make the the grave site a little bit better we can make it a little bit prettier but there's nothing we can do to bring this person back but thanks be to god he can do the impossible friends death is not the last word our diagnoses, our tragedies, our losses. These are not the end for those in Jesus. George Herbert writes, Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him for me just a gardener. Wow. If you are in Jesus when you die, you are just a seed planted in the ground waiting to be spring back to life. That's what you are in Jesus. And because Jesus walked out of that tomb, 
we can trust that he, he is who he said he was. That he, we can trust everything he told us. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. We, we can trust God to do the impossible. To live in his kingdom now and to live in his kingdom after we die. We will be raised to life. That's why we have hope. And finally, friends, let me give you one more reason. We have hope because we can be forgiven and reconciled. The angel says to the woman, Go, tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. Now, if you have been with our church the last couple of weeks, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and we've looked pretty closely at the failure and the faithlessness of Jesus' disciples and his friends. They all said that they would stick by Jesus no matter what. Oh yeah, we'll be with you, Lord. We'll be with you to the very end no matter what. But every single one of them did not follow through with what they said they would do for Jesus. And I think Mark wants us to see as he's writing for the church that we are often just as faithless to Jesus as these disciples. We don't keep our commitments or our word to him. But I want, I want you to notice that even after this great period of all of their failures and their faithlessness, it still said the fa- this faithless group is still called his disciples. They're his disciples. Jesus is not ashamed to identify with this broken, sinful group. They're his disciples. And Peter, he gets a a special mention. Peter famously denied Jesus emphatically three times. And the angel says, go tell Peter. Go tell Peter that Jesus is raised from the dead. It's not too late for Peter to come back to Jesus. And friend, it's not too late for you. No matter what you've done or how long you've been away, You can come back. He loves you. And the angel then tells them, Jesus is going on ahead of you you to Galilee and plans to meet the disciples there. You know, Jesus, in a way, he's he's getting, after, after they dispersed and they've run away, Jesus is now getting the band back together. You know, the Beatles were a worldwide success for a period in the late 1960s. And when all of their talents and personalities were combined at the right moment, they were able to do something spectacular in the world. But unfortunately, they could not keep the band together. And despite some individual successes uh, for for them uh, afterwards, they were really never able to replicate what they were able to do together as a band. And Jesus wants to make sure that this does not happen to his disciples. He wants to keep the band together. Uh, And it's amazing that the disciples' sin, their failure, running away from Jesus, not being there, not keeping their word, that did not break them up. I mean, every single one of them could have pointed at the other for your bad behavior. You didn't follow through. But not one of them was without sin. And Jesus calls them back together to Galilee, to where it all started. To where it all began. Timothy Gombe says, This is the promise of a new start, an opportunity to refresh and renew their relationship to Jesus. And so they take Jesus up on this opportunity for a fresh start. And except for Judas, we know they all stayed together, they reconciled, and they began the movement that we now know as the Church of Jesus Christ. Friends, the disciples' failure did not lead to the end of the church. Afterwards, Jesus brought them back together for a fresh start. Come back to Galilee. Let's start over. Let's go back to where this all began. We still have a mission and we still have a message of hope for the world. And that's a message for you and I today. Come back to the beginning. Come back to the mission. Come back to the hope that we have Uh, We can be forgiven of all that we've done. We can be reconciled in Jesus Christ. Jesus gave them and he gives us a new, a fresh start. And so there is always hope for renewal, for reconciliation, for revival, 
for the forgiveness of all of our sins. You have a fresh start with God and a fresh start with the church. Will you take it? So friends, because Jesus walked out of the tomb, we have hope because what we do matters eternally. We can trust that God can do the impossible and we know that we can always be forgiven and reconciled no matter what we've done or what has happened. So how can you respond to this good news? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, this is a reminder that your service in the Lord is never in vain. Uh, It's a reminder that it matters eternally. Uh, It's a reminder that you have hope in the most dire of circumstances, that no matter what happens to you, you know the end of the story. You know that Jesus wins. You know that you'll be risen from the dead with him. You know that you will live truly happily ever after with joy and peace in him. So no matter how bad the story looks right now, you know the end. So take comfort in that. And it's also a reminder of how much grace is available for you, for me, for all of us. And it's also a reminder that the mission continues. Now, perhaps we've been like these women initially were. It says that they were too afraid to say anything to anyone. Does that not describe many followers of Jesus? Does it perhaps describe you? If so, pray that God would give you the boldness to no longer be be afraid Don't let that be your legacy in Jesus. Too afraid to say anything to anyone. See, that could have been the woman's legacy. But we know from the other Gospels, and we know from history, that they were able to overcome their fear, to be the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, and to boldly share that he is alive and not dead. Now, if you're here, if if you're with us in person, or you're watching online, and you do not consider yourself a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to trust in him and to start following him today. No obstacle, no disappointment, no thing is more important in your life than your eternal life. And Jesus died on that cross, and he rose again so that you could have hope and that you could know that you will have eternal life with him forever. But you must receive this gift. You must place your trust in him and and desire to submit your life to his lordship, to his kingship. And so I want to give you an opportunity as I close this morning to do that right now uh, by praying to him. And I'll help you. I'm going to end with this in a prayer. And you can pray this in your heart along with me. And if you feel God speaking to you, tugging at your heart, I encourage you to say this prayer genuinely with me and you will be saved and brought into the kingdom of Jesus. So please pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and overcoming death. Forgive all my sins. Come into my life and into my heart. I trust in you. Help me to follow you from this day forward. Amen. Well, friend, if you prayed that prayer, you are now a child of God, welcomed into the kingdom of Jesus. We welcome you and we celebrate with you. And as we continue our service, friends, uh, Zach's is going to come up and lead us in a time of communal prayer. Um, Please know that I truly uh, am devastated that I cannot be there with you to celebrate the resurrection this morning. Just remember that God loves you. Remember to go be the church and make disciples. I love you. Happy Easter. He is risen.